There have been a number of studies which have shown that a person who experiences a cluster of life crises runs a 75% or higher risk of becoming sick in the next year or two. The more serious the crises, the more serious will be the illness. Unless a person can learn to let crises run off his back like water on a duck, it's not easy. And no matter how phlegmatic we become, there are going to be some life crises that will affect us deeply. People tend not to connect the effect, the accident or illness, with the cause, the crises, because of the time lag. A good friend of mine underwent a serious and protracted business failure. He's an extremely happy, easygoing person. Two years later, he developed a bleeding ulcer. Now, so much time had elapsed since the business failure, he didn't connect the two events until it was brought to his attention. It takes the body a long time sometimes to complete its physiological reaction to mental or emotional problems. I understand that North Australian Aborigines have never connected the sex act with the birth of a child, the two being separated by nine months. Since they do not keep domestic animals, which is where it's believed human beings first began to put two and two together, they believe pregnancy is caused by a woman's inadvertently looking at a particular mountain in the region. Because of their belief, women sleep with their backs to the mountain and go about their days with eyes averted. And when they get pregnant, they believe they must have looked at the mountain without realizing it or faced it during their sleep. Undergoing a serious mental stress should remind us that illness or accident will follow unless we're able to quickly shake it off. So daily practice in keeping calm and collected is an excellent method for maintaining good mental and physical health. It will also result in many other benefits on the job and at home. Try the deep breath method. You've seen athletes do that when things get a big tense. All experienced athletes do. It's a good relaxant. C. Northcote Parkinson has written about a major discovery he made in clinical medicine. The busiest people have no time to be sick. Executives who are or think they are indispensable at the office have minor indispositions that begin Friday night and disappear by Monday morning. Their major illnesses immediately follow the end of some major task, and if the work continues at crisis level, they do not fall sick at all. They become as immune as physicians during an epidemic, mothers with large families, or sailors during a gale at sea. This fact would convince us, even if we didn't already suspect, that there is a voluntary element in many an illness. The patient has dropped his subconscious guard and allowed himself to collapse. He wants to rest and can see no other way to get it. The mother of seven small children was asked, What would happen if he got sick? And she replied, I have no time to be sick. Our bodies operate best, it seems, when there's a great deal to do, when we're challenged, when there's a goal involved. Take these away and apathy and introspection set in. We're turned in upon ourselves and we can usually find something to be sick about, sick physically or miserable and sick emotionally and then sick physically. Here's something from my friend Chris Haggerty that I liked. He said, the goal of most leaders is to cause people to think more of the leader. The goal of the exceptional leader is to cause people to think more of themselves. And that's true whether you're leading a family, a business, an athletic team, or any other group of people. If a person wants to assess his leadership qualifications, here's a good place to begin. Young people are often bothered by their consideration of their value as persons. It's easier for an adult to assess his own worth to society and to his family, but a youngster who lives as a satellite of the family, who produces no income, who does nothing more constructive than maybe go to school and perform a few chores, often suffers from a sense of doubt as to his real worth as a person. And we need to reinforce the fact that he is important to us, and that he can be of considerable importance as he grows older, that he can make a substantial contribution to his world, country, and society, as well as to himself and his own family someday. This applies to daughters, of course, as well as to sons. A good little story to pass along to our kids is the one about the bar of iron. As a bar of iron, it may be worth, let's say, five dollars. The same piece of iron made into horseshoes would sell for ten fifty. If made into needles, it would be worth five thousand dollars. And if it's turned into balance springs for watches, it would have a total value of about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The genius and workmanship of man can bring value out of the most ordinary seeming substances, but what of a person? How do you place a value on a human being? His importance far exceeds that of all the bars of iron in the world. In his ability to know and his capacity to love, he transcends the value we place on things. But in the last analysis, it's the person himself who must determine his value to himself and his world. We know that in every young person there are all the necessary ingredients of greatness. The degree of greatness that he or she will ultimately achieve will depend only upon the extent to which the person develops and brings his or her real powers to bear. And in that way, can the person be compared to that bar of iron? The value of a piece of iron or a person depends upon what is made from the basic material. S.P. Sherman wrote, In the days of one's youth, in one's period of apprenticeship, it is of far more importance to make oneself an effective instrument 
than it is to know precisely how or where the instrument is to be used. Temper the iron, sharpen the blade, and rest assured the world will use it. And Peter Drucker has pointed out that since we live in an age of innovation, a practical education must prepare a person for work that does not yet exist and cannot yet be clearly defined. It isn't necessary that we see the future too clearly. We need only do to the best of our ability that which we know we should be doing today and realize that in the scheme of things, our turn of the wheel will most certainly come around. It must be quite confusing to millions of young people in school in the complex world of today trying to decide what they'll ultimately do as adults. And while it's something to give a lot of thought to, it isn't anything to worry about if our preparation is very good. It's of far more importance to make oneself an effective instrument than it is to know precisely how or where the instrument is to be used. Temper the iron, sharpen the blade, and rest assured the world will use it. Quite often we find young people rebelling at school because, as they so often put it, I don't even know what I want to do. Regardless of what they ultimately choose to do, a good preparation will be necessary. Rather than being a reason for not continuing their education, not knowing what one wants to do as an adult is the best reason for making sure our education is adequate. And here's a good idea when you want to convince another person to follow your line of reasoning, especially when you're trying to sell something. It's called the feel-felt-found system of converting another to your way of thinking. Whenever the person throws up an objection to the point you're trying to make, say, I know how you feel. Others have felt the same way. Until they found, and here you replace an objection with a positive benefit. I know how you feel. Now here you're empathizing and getting on the side of the other person. Others have felt the same way. Here you're not only agreeing with him, but bolstering his point in security by saying that others have felt the same way. Until they found that, and here you show them all the error of their ways, until they found that that was actually a real benefit in disguise because, and so on. Feel, felt, found. A way to get rid of objections without offending or turning off the person you're dealing with. Good with spouses and kids as well as with co-workers and prospects. I picked that up while listening to a lecture by my good friend Chris Haggerty. He also suggests that if you're in selling, and this is a great one to pass along to your salespeople, you should obtain and use every day three important items. One, a cassette tape player. Two, a daily calendar of appointments. And three, a stopwatch. All three will help you become aware of the structure of time. After every call, give a verbal summary of the call into the cassette tape recorder, including any promises you made, why you think the sale was made or lost, and so forth. This takes only a few minutes and should be done while the sales call is fresh in your mind. The daily calendar is self-explanatory, and the stopwatch will possibly for the first time show you exactly how much time you're spending in front of prospects. As you go in to see the person you're calling on, not his office or his secretary or receptionist, but as you actually go in to see the prospect, start the stopwatch. Stop it as you come out. And don't start it again until you're in front of another prospect. At the end of the day, you will have an accurate record of the time you've actually spent practicing your trade or profession. Chances are it'll be less time than you thought, and that you can find ways of increasing it. Some good points on the importance of time control. The only person who can afford to take off time to loaf is the well-organized person. A book that's been a favorite of mine for more years than I care to count is Kenneth Good's excellent book, How to Win What You Want. In it, Mr. Good gives a recipe for winning anything that I think you'll find of value. 1. If you work for anybody else, support your leader eagerly and without question until the time shall come to demonstrate to the advantage of both that you are, at some one point at least, smarter than he is. 2. If you work for yourself, start moving. Moving forward in a straight line. Keep moving forward along that line regardless of obstacles weighing on its merits each advance as it arises. Don't confuse obstacles and objections. That is to say, don't consider that probable obstacles to finishing anything are possible objections to starting it. That difference in viewpoint may turn the balance between success and failure. There are at least three sound reasons for not stopping for anything until it stops you. One, if the undertaking has never started, all the weary discussion about any obstacles will have been wasted. Two, when the difficulty of doing anything is advanced as an argument against going ahead, a wrong emotional and personal emphasis is likely to arise. Three, human judgment at best finds extraordinary difficulty in telling an obstacle from a blessing. Best and worst are so often the same. Viewed in the perspective of results, some disasters become veritable lifesavers, and some apparent lifesavers prove disastrous. Walter Hunt thought himself a magnificent businessman when he got $400 for an idea it had taken him only three hours to perfect. But he had sold out his patent rights to the safety pin. 
On the other hand, believe it or not, Ripley wanted to be a professional baseball pitcher, had a tryout with the New York Giants, broke his arm, and vastly disappointed, slid back into sports cartooning. His first timid, believe it or not, eased into the corner of a sporting cartoon the statement that Lindbergh was the 67th man to fly the Atlantic. That elicited thousands of letters, so Ripley, instead of shuttling back and forth from ball games, traveled the world 30,000 miles a year and made more money and had more fun than he would have believed possible before he broke his arm. So go slow in your acceptance of obstacles. Consider instead the worthwhileness of the goal and how to steer the straight line to it. Avoid, of course, as even Napoleon and Nelson would avoid the higher impossibilities, but foresee as Napoleon would foresee and override after your own best fashion and crush in advance the perpetual crop of dull reflex and reactionary can'ts and won'ts. Stick to the strong probability that every Alp has some way over or under or through or around it. I wonder how many good ideas, even great ideas, have been picked to death by committees or rendered stillborn by the fear of obstacles that could have been overcome one by one. Before you begin anything worthwhile, obstacles will swarm to confront you. If you start counting the obstacles, you'll never stop counting them. Once started, however, you won't stop to count. John W. Gardner has pointed out that the image created by those who live on the fringes of society and by most of their predecessors going back to the 19th century Bohemians has led us to suppose that people of high originality are somehow lawless. But the truly creative man is not an outlaw, but a lawmaker. Every great creative performance since the initial one, he writes, has been in some measure a bringing of order out of chaos. It's a good quotation. Many people seem to believe that the most creative people are strange, neurotic, and eccentric, and live their lives on the outer edges of civilized society. It's not true. The truly creative person does not seek to destroy the existing order. It's the misfit who does that. The creative person simply tries to improve it. He's not a terror down. He's a builder up. Moreover, the truly creative person tends to be rather conservative in his personal habits, in his dress, in his home. There are exceptions, of course, but for the most part, the most creative people in society would not stand out as being different in a room full of people. What the creative person does do is see things not as they are, but as they could be. He lives in that third language, the language of the hope, of the future, of the imagination. Nor are creative persons found in just a few fields, such as the arts, the theater, advertising, inventing, and so on. They're to be found in every field, every walk of life. Many of them earn their livelihoods through their creativity. Many more are created just for the fun of it, or perhaps because they couldn't be any other way even if they wanted to. Far more people are genuinely creative than you might suspect. The great thing about using your mind creatively is that this ability improves with age. It's one of the great compensations for growing older. It's great, too, for young people, but every year of experience adds to the fund of possible combinations for new and better ideas. The recent, and to some extent, the present romper room era in the advertising business is really nothing new. Eric Hoffer has pointed out that throughout history, the great creative geniuses and innovators have been quite young, and the graybeards who had various industries today were themselves tremendously creative when they were young and just getting started, and they're even more creative today if they haven't let the status quo sneak up on them and harden their channels of creativity. Nicholas Johnson is a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission and author of an excellent book, How to Talk Back to Your Television Set, and an article which appeared in the July-August issue of The Humanist titled TV and the Careening of America. In it, he reminds us that the general semanticist Alfred Korzybski described three categories of mental health, sane, insane, and unsane. His point was that most of us, while not insane, are unsane. That is, we're not living up to our potential as human beings. We're not fully functioning. The so-called human potential movement, including the late Abraham Maslow, argues that even the healthy human beings among us function at perhaps 5% of their potential. He then asks us to reflect and ask ourselves, how many people do I know, or better yet in his words, how many people do you know whom you think of as fully functioning personalities? How many are there in whose daily lives there's a measure of beauty, contact with nature, artistic creativity, some philosophical contemplation or religion, love, self-fulfilling productivity of some kind, participation in life support activities, physical well-being, a spirit of joy, and individual growth. That's what the world's great theologians, psychiatrists, poets, and philosophers have been telling us human life is all about, but few of us have come close to realizing that potential. Speaking of some of the problems of commercial television, Mr. Johnson later says, I've become more and more aware of the extent to which television not only distributes programs and sells products, but also preaches a general philosophy of life. Television tells us hour after gruesome hour that the primary measure of an individual's worth is his consumption of products, 
is measuring up to ideals that are found in packages mass-produced and distributed by corporate America. Many products and even programs, but especially the drug commercials, sell the gospel that there are instant solutions to life's most pressing personal problems. You don't need to think about your own emotional maturity and development of individuality, your discipline, training, and education, your perception of the world, your willingness to cooperate and compromise and work with other people. You don't need to think about developing deep and meaningful human relationships and trying to keep them in repair. Not only do the programs and commercials explicitly preach materialism, conspicuous consumption, status consciousness, sexploitation, and fantasy worlds of quick, shallow solutions, but even the settings and subliminal messages are commercials for the consumption style of life. Look at the settings. Auto ads push clothes, fashion, and vacations. Furniture wax ads push wall-to-wall carpeting and draperies. Breakfast cereal ads push new stoves and refrigerators. Not surprisingly, the programs do the same. After all, they're paid for by the same guys who pay for the commercials. In fact, he writes, there's a rather intricate corporate interlock of jobs, products, and lifestyle. Once you come into the circle at any point, you take on nearly all of it. And once you're in it, it's very difficult to get a little bit out. The choices you're left are relatively meaningless, like which color and extras do you want with your Chevrolet, Scotch, or bourbon, how mod your ties will be, and which toothpaste you'll use. It all fits. Corporate white-collar jobs, suburban home, commuting by automobile, eating in restaurants, and the clothes. There's the canned so-called entertainment of radio and television for boredom, bottled alcohol and aspirin for pain, and aerosol cans of deodorant and room freshener to maintain the antiseptic cleanliness of it all. You wear your office, your home, and your car as much as your clothes and deodorant, and from the corporate layers of externals comes your very identity and the smothering of your soul. Mr. Johnson goes on to say, I'd be the first to acknowledge that we are, of course, talking about matters of personal taste. People should be free to choose the life they want. Certainly it ought not to be the business of government to choose lifestyles for its citizens. But two facts remain. First, a wholly disproportionate, if not exclusive, emphasis of television pushing only one point of view. The choice you'll never know is the choice you'll never make. Many Americans are not sufficiently informed of the alternatives to make an intelligent choice of the life they most want. Second, independent students of our society, wholly apart from their own personal preferences, believe there's a correlation between the philosophy preached by television and many of our social problems. The gospel of television simultaneously seems to create tremendous anxiety and alienation in the poor and emptiness and neuroses in the affluent. As we're sold the products, we are given the belief that our world as individuals turns on our capacity to consume. We're given a shot of anxiety for free, told to buy more to make it go away, and find that feeling only gets worse. But apart from the content, the mere act of television watching is a passive activity. When we turn it on, we turn ourselves off. If it's true that passivity and a sense of powerlessness are among the most dangerous epidemics in our society today, the television set is suspect at the outset regardless of what's programmed on it. Earlier in the article, Commissioner Johnson presents the sobering statistic that the average child will have received more hours of instruction by television by the time he enters first grade than he will later spend in college classrooms earning a B.A. degree. By the time he's a teenager, he will have spent fifteen to 20,000 hours with the television set and will have been exposed to 250 to 500,000 commercials. It would seem simple common sense to assume that this exposure has its influence. In any event, since hard-headed businessmen are willing to bet $3 billion a year in advertising budgets on the proposition that it is having an effect, they are at least effectively stopped from arguing the contrary. In looking for answers, Commissioner Johnson says, I think television could and should help us understand the alternatives to the conspicuous consumption chemical corporate lifestyle, not because I'm right, but because there are alternatives. People are entitled to know about them and experience them if they choose, and today's televised theology seems to be contributing very little to life or liberty or the pursuit of happiness which somebody once thought was the business of government. Suppose you don't want to drop out or camp out. Maybe you want to step in, try to make things a little better, or just earn a living. What then? How can we make life in a corporate state more livable and more human? It became obvious to me, he wrote, that if I were going to criticize television for not offering alternative lifestyles, I'd have to be able to find the answer to that question. So I set about it. Camping in the West Virginia mountains for two weeks reaffirmed my latent but basic commitment to the psychic values of simplicity. You not only get along with substantially fewer things when camping in the woods, you actually enjoy life more because it's not so cluttered with objects. The experience gave me a way of thinking about simplicity, objects, and natural living that I had not had before. 
had it impressed upon me for perhaps the first time a sense of the interrelated totality of life support activities. By life support activities, I mean the provision of those things that are necessary to sustain physical life for ourselves, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and so forth. These are the kinds of activities which I became most fully aware of in the woods because I had to, and because they can be most easily comprehended when reduced to their basics. And yet I used to give almost no attention to these kinds of activities. Food simply appeared on my dinner table ready to eat. The house I lived in was purchased. It was warmed or cooled by some equipment in the basement that I knew very little about and was attended to by repairmen when necessary. Clothing was something I found in closets and dresser drawers. It was cleaned and mended by my wife, the maid, or a cleaning establishment. Transportation was provided by the municipal bus system for commuting and by FCC drivers during the day. At my office, I was not only surrounded by machinery, copying machines, electric typewriters, dictating machines, and so forth, but also by people paid to operate them for me, answer my telephone, and bring coffee. I had, in short, taken very nearly all my life support activities, my life, and cut them up into bits and pieces which I parceled out to individuals, corporations, and machines around me. The upshot was that there was very little of it left for me to live. This was extraordinarily efficient in one sense, that is, I was working at perhaps 99% of the ultimate level of professional production of which I'm capable. But what I concluded was that it was bad for life, for I was living only a small percentage of my ultimate capacity to live. In an industrialized urban environment, it's easy to forget that human life still is, as it was originally, sustained by certain basic functions. I think some participation in the support of your life is essential to a sense of fulfillment. I do not, however, think that you need to do everything for yourself. For one thing, you can't trace everything back to first elements. You can build your own furniture, but are you going to saw your own boards from your own trees? Are you going to insist on making your own nails from your own iron ore? Even the most deeply committed do-it-yourselfers reach some accommodation with civilization. In the second place, you simply don't have time to do it all. To raise and can all your own fruits and vegetables, for example, would take substantially more time per year than most people are prepared to give to it especially if you're also personally constructing your own home, weaving your own material, and making your own clothes, and walking everywhere. In the third place, many conveniences of urbanized life are there anyway, and you might as well use them. They can save you time you might spend in other more satisfying ways. There's no point to cooking in your fireplace every night or on your corporate cookout charcoal grill if you have a gas or electric range sitting in your kitchen. So my conclusion is, he writes, that you ought to try to do a little bit of all your life support activities, and a substantial amount of whichever one or two of them appeal to you the most and make the most practical sense for you. I've taken to buying and preparing my own simple foods, he writes, doing some modest mending of clothes, preparing some logs I intend to make into furniture, and providing my own transportation by bicycle. Undoubtedly, other activities will fit better with your own life pattern. If you start looking around for simplification, ways to make you less possession-bound and give you more chance to participate in your life, the opportunities are endless. Start by searching your house or apartment for things to throw away. Ask yourself, if I were living in the woods, would I spend a day going to town to buy this aerosol can? Look for simple substitutes. Bicarbonate of soda, for example, can substitute for the following products. Toothpaste, gargle and mouthwash, burn ointment, stomach settlers, room freshener, icebox cleaner, children's clay, baking powder, and so forth. And it only costs 12 cents a box. Get the idea? Yes, we get the idea. He explains that the point is to find your own soul and kick it and poke it with a stick, see if it's still alive, and then watch which way it moves. Makes sense, doesn't it? In returning to Earth, in trying to find our real selves and to determine what's really important and what isn't, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to find our own souls and kick them and poke them with a stick and see if they're still alive and then watch which way they move. That's the way to heed Socrates' advice, know thyself. I can recommend that you buy and read Commissioner Johnson's book, How to Talk Back to Your Television Set, and his newer book, How to Talk Back to Your Corporate State, both available in Bantam paperbacks. Commissioner Johnson leaves no doubt in anyone's mind that